All right, so the way I understand the book of Hebrews is, number one, I don't know who wrote it. I'm not convinced anybody does know who wrote it. People, some people think Barnabas. Some people think Paul. Some people think, well, other people. But m most people think Paul. The church accepted that it was Pauline for a long time, and now a lot of people don't think so. I don't know. We do know who it's to. Anybody want to take a guess as to who it's to? The Hebrews, to the Jewish Christians in the first century. So we know that. And really the thrust of this book is the passing from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. And I really think that's the whole thrust of the New Testament if you hadn't figured that out yet. So let's begin reading. I'll read the whole thing. We'll start in verse 1. If you want to stop me, feel free to stop me. But I want us to get a feel for this. I wanted to take this one day to do it because this whole thing is one sermon and it all fits together. It doesn't do us any good to chop it up verse by verse if you don't hear the whole thing together at first. So let's begin. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by His Son, in whom He has appointed heir of all things, through whom also He made the worlds, or the ages, who being the brightness of His glory in the express image of His person, and upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had, Jesus, by Himself purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of the Majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as He has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did He, God, ever say, You are My Son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to Him a Father, and He shall be to Me a Son. But when He again brings the firstborn into the world, He says, Let all the angels of God worship Him. And of the angels, He says, Who makes His angels spirits and His ministers a flame of fire? But to the Son, He says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of Your kingdom. You have loved righteousness, hated lawlessness. Therefore God your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak you will fold them up, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not fail. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits, sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast in every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken of by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard Him? God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to His own will. For He has not put the world to come, of which we speak in subjection to angels, but one testified in a certain place, saying, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels, you have crowned him with glory and honor, and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. We're in Hebrews, we're in chapter 2. Uh, we're in Hebrews 2.10. All right, everybody kind of see what's going on here to, to, to begin with? you got two thoughts, really, and two ways you can go with this. One of which being when you read things like the beginning and worlds and um, putting in subjection under His feet. Look at verse 5 again. Verse 5 says, For He has not put the world to come. When you start thinking about those things, right away your mind goes to either physical planet or old covenant passing away. So you're going to have to make a distinction when we get to the end of this sermon in just a minute. Is this talking about the passing away of the physical planet or the passing away of their old covenant world giving way to the new covenant world that would come? So make sure you're thinking about that as we're going through here. 
Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. For it was fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. Now, where is he quoting from there? Yeah, Old Testament. So when we get there, what are we going to have to do? Yeah, we're going to go back and put it in context about the Messiah. Verse 14, Inasmuch then, as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, okay, underline that. You should probably make a note there. I think that flesh and blood is an old covenant reference. He himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy, and, but I also think it's a physical deal. So anyway, we'll get there and we'll get there. He, he himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. That will be important. You should underline it. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. All right, think about that. You get the idea of angels in sin and that God put forth a redemptive plan for angels whenever they were in sin. Yes or no? That God put forth a redemptive plan for angels when they were in sin. No, but to the seed of Abraham, meaning those who would be saved, he does. Okay. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be merciful and a faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself suffered, being tempted, and is able to aid those who are tempted. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, Consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Jesus Christ, who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than who? Old Covenant reference. Inasmuch as he who has built the house has far more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant, for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, notice that house, that new covenant house of people, dwelling place, if we hold fast to the confidence and that rejoicing of hope firm to the end. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the days of trial in the wilderness. Exodus themes. Where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works forty years. Therefore I was angry with that generation and said, They always go astray in their hearts and have not known me and have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, They shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said, Today, if you will hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. So that's another thing we're going to have to identify going through the book of Hebrews. What is the end that is spoken of? It'll be another thing. Verse 16. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter his rest because of unbelief. All right, let me ask a question. In the first Exodus, where were they trying to enter? But who, the unbelievers, where did the unbelievers who died in the wilderness, where did they fail to enter? What land? Yeah, Canaan. So Canaan is a picture of rest. But now in this new covenant in Hebrews, what we're getting is a spiritual second exodus. We're getting a spiritual place of rest. Make sense, everybody? Good? All right. There will be a lot to be said about chapter 3 and 4. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, 
let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. All right, let me just make a note right here. I won't teach it, but notice how it says, a promise remains for entering his rest. Have they entered, the Hebrews, the first century saints, had they entered into the fullness of whatever this rest was yet? Yes or no? Okay. Note that. I won't teach it, but just note that. Some form of entering the rest still remain. Now, let me ask a question. Had Jesus died on the cross yet? Yes or no? Has Jesus rose from the dead yet? Yes or no? This is in roughly the 60s A.D., probably about 65, 66 A.D. But there's still something that's not completely finished yet. Make a note of that. That's really important. And I don't think that I understood that for a lot of my life. And I don't think a lot of Christians understood that at this point. Yep, there was more to be fulfilled. Verse 2. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest as he has said. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day. Now we know the seventh day was the day of what? For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Notice the quote there, 2 Samuel 7, 14. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience, again he designates a certain day, saying to David, Today, after such a long time, as it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Now watch this, this is good. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he, God, would not afterward have spoken of another day, another day of rest. How did Joshua give them rest? Where did Joshua lead them to? What land did Joshua conquer? Canaan and the Promised Land. He gave them a rest. But that rest was a type and shadow of the rest that was to come that Jesus, literally the true and better Joshua, who has the same name, Yeshua, would come and give them. Verse 9. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. Old covenant, a covenant of works, yes or no? Do they have to do a lot of different type of works and stuff in the old covenant? Yes or no? New covenant, you got to do those works? See the picture? See where we're headed here? The new covenant has broken in at the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The new covenant will fully be established at the end of this age, AD 70, when the old covenant will pass away. Age of works, over, full completion, and that rest. Are we entered into the presence of God based upon works? I think the answer is yes, but not mine and your works. Whose works do we enter upon? Yeah, the finished work of Jesus Christ. So that's the, that's the picture. So here's the, the whole point. Old covenant, nothing we can do. We'd never be good enough. Couldn't uphold it and keep it to stay in the presence of God. Our works aren't good enough. New covenant, fully based upon the finished work of Jesus Christ. It's His works that are going to take us and me and you are into this full rest that God has given us. Make sense? All right. Verse 11. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Meaning, they didn't believe in the wilderness, they turned back. Whole point of the book. In the first Exodus, when they're wandering around the wilderness, where do they want to go back to? In the first century, these Jews who were now Christians believing in Jesus, where did they want to go back to? The Old Covenant. Is everybody good? Okay. Same, that's why Jerusalem becomes Egypt in the New Testament. And that's important for understanding the book of Revelation. All right. Um, verse 12. For the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of soul and the joints of marrow, and discerning, uh, discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open, notice the Genesis language, and open the eyes of him who we must give account. Seeing then that we have a great high priest, who's the high priest? Who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace, help in the time of need. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in these things pertaining to God, 
that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is also subject to weakness. Because of this, he is required, as for the people, now this is speaking of the old covenant priest, he's required, as for the people, so also for himself to offer sacrifices for what? So old covenant priests were sinners. They had to offer sacrifice for themselves. Verse 4, No man takes this honor to himself, but he who is called by God, just as Aaron was. So also is Christ. He did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, Psalm 110, 4, You are a priest forever, according to the order of who? Melchizedek, a physical priesthood on the earth or a spiritual priesthood? Okay, we got it changing. Yeah, Melchizedek's a spiritual priesthood as opposed to Aaron or the Levitical priesthood. Jesus is a priest, but of a different covenant, of a different order. Not of the order of Aaron, but of the order of Melchizedek. Verse 7. Who in the days of his flesh, when he offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and was heard because of his godly fear, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him, called by God as high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. They should have been mature at this stage, but they were still spiritually lacking. They didn't understand. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are full of age. That is, those who by reason have use of their senses, exercise to discern both good and evil. We good? We're about halfway. Therefore, Leaving the discussion of the elementary principles. Underline that. Oh, you should underline that. I can't wait to get there to talk about the elementary principles and what that's about. That word for elementary there is the Greek word stoikeion. That word is used all over the place for the Old Testament. Paul will bring it up. Peter will bring it up. We'll get there. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, remember the Old Covenant type and shadow, let us go on to perfection, New Covenant. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works to faith toward God, doctrine of baptisms, laying on hands, resurrection of the dead, of eternal judgment, and this we will do if God permits. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened to have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partaker of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. That's another thing you've got to underline. What's, what's the age to come? Are, are we in that or No. If they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put Him to open shame. So we're going to get tested on whether or not a man can lose his salvation in Hebrews chapter 6 and 10. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it's cultivated receives blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed whose end is to be what? All right, notice this. Oh, I want to teach this already. I think i got to make a mention of this. Okay, number one, this idea of curse and thorns and briars, where's the first place your mind goes when you read that? Yeah, Genesis. So that's the very first place my mind goes. But also, notice here that whatever bears thorns and briars and is rejected and going to be cursed and burned up at the end. Remember the John the Baptist deal in Matthew chapter 3? John said, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And he said, if you don't repent, then you're going to be burned up like stubble. Same idea. Same concept. With me on that? You should go read Matthew 13, 36 to 43 this week in the parable of the wheat and tares. It literally says the exact same thing that we just read there. Anyway, I'll leave it alone. I'll teach it when we get there. It's hard not to do though. Verse 9. Beloved, we are confident. I could make a note in verse 7 on earth too, but I won't. Okay, anyway, we'll leave it. We'll get there. But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you, yes, things that accompany salvation, 
though we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love which you have shown toward His name, and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister, and we desire that each of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath of confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Genesis 15, we'll get there. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel, confirmed by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it's impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. Let me make a note. Remember in Genesis 15 when God told Abraham to take the offerings and the sacrifice? And remember how they made a covenant back in those days? Two men with lock arms passed through the covenant after it split apart. What did God do to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15? Remember what He did to him? He put him asleep. Then there were those two things that were represented as God, and God Himself passed through and passed through that covenant. Meaning that the covenant with Abraham ultimately wasn't dependent upon the work of man. The, work, the covenant with Abraham ultimately was dependent upon the work of who? That's Hebrews chapter 6, 13 to whatever we just read. That God made the when he could swear by no one greater, verse 16, he made an oath of confirmation is an end to all things. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly the heirs of promise, the immutability of His counsel, confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things, which it's impossible for God to lie, God made the covenant and assured it to Abraham by confirming it through Himself, and God's not a liar, that we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. What he's saying is that the Hebrews in the first century they could trust that that old covenant system was passing away because of the promises that God made to Abraham because they were set before him in promise. Verse 19. This, we have, this hope we have as an anchor for our soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Hope is an extremely important word in the New Testament. Titus chapter 2 verse 13 talks about the Christian's blessed hope. And for so many years I was taught that, well, the Christian, and so many people still think it, the Christian's blessed hope is to be taken off of this world so that all the bad are gone. That's not the Christian's blessed hope. The Christian's blessed hope and the Old Testament saint's blessed hope and Israel's blessed hope and mine and your blessed hope is all the same blessed hope. Guess what the hope is? The fullness of the new covenant which gives us the fullness of eternal life. You and I experience that when we come into faith. That's the blessed hope. You don't hope for what you have. People are hoping for what we already have, and it absolutely blows my mind. But here's the failure. Hear me out. Hear me out. Here's the failure. They'll read books such as Hebrews, and they'll think that you and I are still in the same inner uh, mitten, carryover, what's, give me a word to call it, transitional. They read it, and they think me and you are still in the same transitional period that the Hebrews who this book originally was written to are in. We are not in that transitional period. That transitional period was from AD 30 to AD 70 when the Old and New Covenant were on the scene. And if you understand that, you'll understand the book of Hebrews and the whole New Testament. That'll make way more sense to you. So anyway, let's keep going with that. Verse 7. Anybody want to read? I'll keep reading. I'm on a good pace. I think I got a chance to finish it. Can I go a little faster? I'll stop teaching and start reading. Here we go. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, uh, by the way, Mel oh, dang, I it again. Uh, Melchizedek was the king of Salem. This place was later renamed a different spot, and David knew to build the temple here. Guess the name of the place when it was renamed? Jerusalem. Okay. For this Melchizedek is king of Salem, not up in the hills, priest of Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, that's Genesis 14, we'll get there, uh, and blessed him, to whom also Abraham, watch this, Abraham gave a tenth part to all, first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life 
but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spools. And indeed, those who are the sons of Levi, who received the priesthood, have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he who, whose genealogy is not derived from them, meaning Melchizedek, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. Here mortal men receive tithes, meaning in Old Covenant Jerusalem, but there he receives them of whom it is witness that he lives. Even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes to, through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. You read all that and you're like, man, what in the world is he talking about? It's really simple. It's really simple. Watch this. Abraham, who's the next son? Abraham had who? Isaac, Isaac had who? <clears throat> Jacob had how many sons? Twelve. One of them, the priesthood. Who was the priesthood son? What son was that? Amen. So all of the Aaronic priesthood, which is the old covenant priesthood, through Jacob, through Isaac, through Abraham, paid tithes to Melchizedek. Let me say it a different way. The physical priesthood on the earth paid tithes or homage to Melchizedek, the spiritual priesthood, thus saying that the physical priesthood is lesser than the spiritual priesthood, thus saying that the old covenant is lesser than the new covenant, which is to come. Does that make sense to everybody? That's exactly what that's saying. It's so good, and that's everywhere. It's all over the place. You get that? All right, cool. This book's going to... This book of Hebrews is going to help you understand the Bible so much that it's not even going to be funny. When we're done with this, you're going to be like, I, you're probably going to be like, man, i got a million more questions. And me too, but there will be some things that will help with. All right, here we go. Let's keep going. i got to hurry. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, Old Covenant, for under the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, of necessity there is also a change of the law. We know that. We're under the old covenant law. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe, from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it's evident that our Lord arose from Judah, which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood. Yet it's far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest who has come not according to the law of fleshly commandment, but according to the law of the power of an endless life. For he testifies... You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment, Old Covenant, because of its weakness and unprofitableness. For the law made nothing what? That's the whole goal of this thing is perfection. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. Everybody see it? And inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. That's the third time Psalm 110 has been quoted. You think that's important? By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become a higher than the heavens, who does not need daily, as those priests, Old Covenant, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weakness, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the Son, Jesus, who has been perfected forever. Everybody get the point there? No need for more sacrifices. No need for another priest. He's the one time forever. Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. Thank you. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true what? which the Lord erected, uh-oh, sound like 2 Samuel 7, remember that? Not the physical house, but a house made without what? Hey, what do we know? Man, we're learning so much. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, therefore it's necessary that this one also, having something to offer, for if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, 
since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and the shadow of the what? Verse 5. Who's, the priests under the law in the Old Covenant serve the copy and the shadow of the what? So, all that's a physical type and shadow for what Jesus did spiritually after He ascended. Okay, let's keep going. As Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. What mountain was that? Good, Ronnie, Sinai. But now he has obtained a more excellent, meaning Jesus, a more excellent ministry, meaning the new covenant ministry is more excellent than the old, inasmuch as he also is the mediator of a better what? Which was established on better promises. Uh, remember that time Moses goes up on the mountain? Moses goes up on the mountain and his face is shining because he saw the glory of God. But over time, remember what happened? What happened to that shining that was on Moses' face? It faded away. You know why it faded away? Ooh, pick me, I know. Guess what it was pointing to? It was pointing to the time that the glory that Moses saw when he received the Old Covenant, that Old Covenant glory was great, but that Old Covenant glory would fade away and it would give way to the New Covenant glory that would come. Beautiful. Verse 7. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord. Jeremiah, here we go, Jeremiah 31. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the houses of Israel for those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their mind and write them on their what? And I will be their God and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will bring back up in the daily sacrifice every year because I have to keep killing an animal. Right? Their sins and their lawless deeds, I'll do what? No more because a perfect sacrifice in Christ has been made. In that he says a new covenant, he has made the first one what? Okay, so they were no longer bound by the old covenant, those centuries, first century saints. But check this next part out, Hebrews 8.13. This is good. In that he says a new covenant, he's made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready or about to do what? What's he talking about? How are they going to know when it vanishes away? When the temple's destroyed. Good. So many people read that and say, well, the Old Covenant was just done whenever Jesus rose from the dead. When Jesus was on the cross, the Old Covenant is not a factor in the, in the New Testament or the Bible story anymore. Friends, that's true. Romans chapter 8, verse 2 says, The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set them free from the law of sin and death. Meaning, when, they, when Jesus rose from the dead and they believed in Jesus, they were no longer bound by the Old Covenant. But just because they were no longer bound by the Old Covenant, it didn't mean that it wasn't still around. Thus, the whole point of the Judaizers in the first century trying to get the Christians, specifically the Jewish Christians, to come back under the law. It was about to vanish away. Verse 9. Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and an earthly sanctuary for a tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all, which had a golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, which is where the golden pot had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. I wish you would have. Now when these things had been thus prepared, the priest always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services, but into the second part the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this, watch this, that the, the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still what? The way back into the Holy of Holies was not fully possible while the tabernacle or his temple was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, who cannot or which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. Then he says, Concern yourselves with only food and drinks, various washings, 
and fleshly ordinances imposed until when? All right, now think about it. Let's think about it. Do we know of anything in the Bible that concerned itself with only being able to eat certain foods and certain drinks that had periodic times of various washings and had fleshly ordinances such as feast days and other holidays that were centered around a covenant structure? Can you think of anything in the Bible that that would be talking about? The old covenant and the law. Now watch what it says at the end there. Posed until the time of reformation. He's saying, concern yourself only with these minor things because it's all passing away. Verse 11. Christ came as high priest of the good things to come. Literally about to come. With the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with what? There you go. That is not of this creation. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with His own blood He entered the most holy place once for all. All right? At the time when the writer of Hebrews wrote this, was Jesus pictured as in the most holy place in the heavenly temple? Yes or no? What that, what, does that verse say that Jesus is in it? Present tense. Not with the blood of goats and bulls and calves, but He with His own blood, He entered, past tense, he's, or He's entered it already at the time this was written, the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if So is He in it? Yes or no? Jeremy says yes. The answer is yes. See how the writer of Hebrews is using the Old Covenant structure to talk about how Jesus is doing that spiritual work in the New Covenant temple. Which is not a physical temple, it's a spiritual temple made with hands. You're moving from, it's like training wheels. You're moving from training wheels in the Old Covenant to a spiritual reality in the New Covenant. But if you don't understand the Old Covenant, then you can't see the spiritual significance of the New Covenant. Let's keep going. Where am I at? 13. For if the blood of goats and bulls and ashes of heifer, sprinkling of the unclean, sanctifies the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? For this reason He is the mediator of a new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the de uh, death of the testator. All right, who's the, t who's the testator of the new covenant? Who is it? Jesus. Whose death was required for the new covenant to become in effect? Jesus. Now you've got a 40-year period where this new covenant is slowly becoming in effect and it will become in full when the old covenant passes away. Let's keep going. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with the water of the scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled the blood of the book itself on all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Remember when Jesus was having the Last Supper and he said, The drink, and this is the blood of the new covenant, my blood, which is poured out for you. Same idea. That's what he's doing. 21. Likewise, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. All right, well, what was the sacrifice and what blood was offered in the heavenly, not the physical? Whose blood was it? There we go. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are the copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that He should offer Himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another. He then would have to suffer or die often since the foundation of the world. But now once at the end of the ages, He, Jesus, has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of Himself, and is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for Him. He will appear a second time apart from sin for what? Everybody got that? I'll never be able to finish the next four chapters. I, I want to end it there. But I want to go back and I want you to finish reading this, okay? So you can kind of see the, the foundation that was laid. Now think about it. Look at verse 28 again. 
Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for Him, He will appear a second time. Okay, there's your second coming. Apart from sin for salvation. So think about the whole picture that's been laid out. Christ is the better priest, the better sacrifice. He's entered into the heavenly temple and they were eagerly waiting for Him to come out of it to declare them righteous so they could enter the fullness of that spiritual rest. Does that make sense? Is everybody good with that? You can read 10... Man, I really want to read it all, but I'll never be able to finish it. I don't have time. I simply don't. I can't do it. I'm going to pray and we'll stop it there. You go read 10, 11, 12, and 13. You go read the next four chapters, 10, 11, 12, and 13 this week. Finish that out and you'll be like, it makes a lot of sense. You'll see how it all ties into a covenantal importance. Let's pray. Thank you.